The day I moved to the U.S. to attend college, back in 2014, I met a girl. She was cute, and being the young, single guy I was at the time, I used my charm. <laughs> I even exaggerated my accent a little bit so she would notice I was foreign. <laughs> but don't judge me, though. I was excited. I thought, if every American girl is like this, I'm going to have a blast in college. <laughs> However, things didn't go as planned, because my perspective changed quickly after she asked me where I was from. I'm from Brazil, I said, excited to overshare about my country, like I always do. But then she replied with the words that would feel like a dagger to my heart, the end of my 15-minute infatuation. What? No way. You're too white to be Brazilian. <laughs> you see, the reason I tell this anecdote is not to shed light on the ignorance of certain people, because trust me, there are plenty of those out there, but rather to explain how that situation could have affected me. I told her, my family is originally from Europe, they're Polish and Belgian immigrants, and that's why I'm white. But what if I didn't know where my family was from? What if I didn't have this much information about my own roots? I'll probably have an identity crisis. I'll probably start questioning myself, even though there's no such thing as being too white or too black to be from a certain region of the world. It made me think, <clears throat> how would she react if I told her that her skin was too orange for her tan not to be fake. <laughs> but jokes, jokes aside, imagine being in a situation in which you're part of a minority and you have that characteristic challenged and questioned. How would that make you feel? So fast forward to 2017, when I flew to Macau in Asia to spend the summer as a Pulitzer Center reporting fellow where the topic of my research was cultural preservation and the importance of not letting languages die. One day, I was just doing some sightseeing, and I went to a local cemetery, and I ended up meeting Qiang Zhang, the man who'd become the center character of my whole project. Zhang was born in Macau, but he was adopted by mainland Chinese parents at the age of two. He never cared much about learning about his biological family, though. But once he finally did, he went to the local agency only to find out that there were no more records of his adoption. And the reason for that is that the documents were originally in Portuguese, because Portugal colonized Macau at the time of his birth. In the late 90s, though, when these documents were being digitized, the agency lacked qualified employees who could translate and preserve these documents, so they ended up just being thrown away. In other words, due to insufficient efforts to preserve a language that was once of extreme importance in that area, Zhang and many other Macanese citizens are now unable to learn about their past and maybe even reconnect with traditions that were once a major part of their lives. And that's only one region in our entire pale blue dot. Oops. The numbers are shocking. More than half of the world's 7,000 languages are in danger of extinction and will most likely disappear in this century. What this means is not only a cultural loss, but a historical one as well. Written records are one of the only reasons we've been able to learn so much about what has happened in the last few thousand years. So by letting a language die, we are risking the potential loss of significant historical knowledge. The identity issues will also only get worse. Understanding where you come from is a major part of understanding who you are. So when I tell Americans that I'm Brazilian, I'm not trying to impress the cute girl who sits by me in my investigative journalism class. I'm trying to tell people a little bit more about the lenses that shape my perspective. Not everything is lost, though. There are several ways that we can help this problem be solved or at least prevent, prevent it from getting it worse. And the main thing that we should do is invest more in cultural preservation efforts. To start off, we need to offer more affordable language learning classes. Back in 2015, when I was in uh, New York City for the Polyglot Conference, I walked in so proud of the three, three and a half languages I could speak. But then I started looking around at other people's badges, and some people listed 15, 16 languages that they could converse in. And that got me thinking. If a human being, even though an extraordinary one, can learn 16 languages fluently, is it that naive for me to think 
that we could have a society in which virtually every person can speak at least two? I don't think so. Secondly, we should promote more artistic and cultural events. Music festivals, film exhibitions, and theater performances will not only help us raise awareness to the potential cultural loss of letting a language die, but they might also inspire an individual to dedicate their lives to helping save that language. We also need to stop forcing people to assimilate and stop judging those who choose to maintain their own beliefs and traditions. Immigration has become an intrinsic part of our society. So instead of expecting the people who come to our countries to fully transition into consumers of our culture, we should embrace theirs as well. As individuals, finally, we should all be a little more empathetic and compassionate. So the next time you see someone wearing something that seems strange or eating a food that you think is weird, just walk up to them and ask why. What's the context behind this behavior? You might learn something. After all, exposure to diversity is the main way that we can educate people into the different cultures that exist in our world. Maybe through a little more exposure, the girl from my freshman year wouldn't have made such an insensitive and uneducated comment. And while I'm not 100% sure what she's up to right now, I'm pretty confident she's not a geography major. <laughs> As for me, I actually met a girl who even knew a couple words in Portuguese. She made me change my mind about American girls, and now I don't even need to exaggerate my accent anymore. <laughs> to finish it, I want you to know one thing. A globalized world means a world of cultural diversity and free expression of traditions and beliefs, not a world that strives to reach a singularity of opinions and behaviors. We've all seen those societies in dystopian movies and novels, and clearly they don't work, so let's just keep them there. The real world needs my culture just as much as it needs yours. Thank you.